This episode is brought to you by Arden Labs Education. Sign up today to learn advanced concepts in Go, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, and more. Visit ardenlabs.com forward slash education for more information. Hey, quick heads up. The audio quality isn't as good as we'd like it to be in this episode. Sorry in advance. Welcome to the Arn Labs podcast. Our special guest today is Steve Wade. Steve, how's it going? Good. How are you, Bill? Pleasure to be here. Good, good. Where are you, uh, where are you talking to us from today? I am based out of London, England. London. I'm going to be there in... At the end of July, I'm gonna, my, my wife has never been in London, and I had to fly through it to go to Berlin. So I said, that's it. I'm going to show you London. I love that city. It's one of my favorite cities. Yeah, today not too great. Overcast, rainy, kind of the classic English weather, really. Um, it's been, been pretty nice, though, the last couple of days, kind of topping out at 20, 21 degrees. So. Yeah, but that's, oh my, you know, you just triggered a memory for me. I was in... London was one of those rainy weeks and I got this most amazing umbrella from the hotel. I guess they were giving out like to borrow, borrow, right? Mm -hmm. And this, this umbrella was one of the best umbrellas I'd, I'd ever had. Like I loved this thing. And that night, one night, there's a fire alarm that goes off in the hotel, right? And of course it's rainy. So I take my umbrella with me because I love this umbrella for whatever reason. Anyway, we're walking down the stairs and this old lady is struggling. I mean, struggling to walk down the stairs and this person's trying to help them. And the guy looks at me, and goes, can we borrow your umbrella? Cause she needed it as a cane. And my whole wow. world just came to an end because I knew I was never getting this umbrella back. Like it was now gone. Right. And of course, I gave it to her. And of course, I'd never seen the umbrella again. <laughs> I, for whatever reason, you just triggered that. <laughs> All right. Fun little uh, story there. Okay. Steve, give uh, everybody a, a couple of minutes uh, about what you're doing today. Sure. So, uh, my name is Steve Wade. Currently, I am one of the founding engineers at a company called KSOC Labs. So what we are doing is building a Kubernetes security operation center. So what that does is there's three kind of life cycles I see when you are building applications to deploy uh, to an environment. Our, our deployment environment at this time is, you know, we're basing it heavily around Kubernetes. So you've got the, the local development cycle of your, you know, you're locally developing in, you know, uh, on your laptop. You then have the, the CI piece to make sure that that um, you know you're you've got the test coverage and you're getting a little bit more confidence that you know you, you're happy with the changes that you've made and then you've got the it's now running in you know in an environment it doesn't necessarily have to be production and what we're looking to do is is to tick the boxes of all three of those areas um, and try and provide uh, information in an informative way back to the customer about how secure their application is how secure their Kubernetes cluster is and what they could do to improve that. Um, and our main goals right now are we're, we're tackling kind of two key areas that we think are untapped. One is this concept of auto remediation. So you deploy a workload into your environment or your, your cluster, and we, we see that there's something wrong with it. Um, I don't know, you're, you're setting the security context or you're allowing root, uh, to, sorry, you're run, allowing the container to run as root. We will run that through our rules engine um, and provide you back a pull request to your repository patching that change. Um, so as a security engineer and a developer, or specifically a developer, the last thing you care about is security. Everyone says they do, but it's, you know, there's, there's more fun things to be doing than, you know, implementing security fixes. Um, and if you're a kind of CISO. No, 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 go on, go on, finish, finish, finish. Um, and if you're a CISO, you just, see a wall of noise, right? If we, if we provide you back and tell you there's hundreds of errors, you, you have to be a, a Kubernetes expert or understand YAML files uh, to know what you're looking at to be able to have that conversation with a developer to potentially help them to fix it. So we are trying to remove the alert fatigue from a, from a CISO or somebody like a security engineer that's viewing a portal and provide them meaningful um, kind of data and changes back to their system so that this feedback loop can be as tight and as fast as it possibly can be. 
But you're doing this against YAML files that are part of a repository for... Um... Yeah, so nowadays, exactly. So nowadays with this kind of the buzzword of GitOps being floated around in the way that, you know, you can deploy and, and manage the workloads that are, are running or the configuration of your Kubernetes cluster, people are using Git as their source of truth. So they allow us to be able to construct pull requests against their repository. We find the deployment or whatever the workload is that's currently having that issue, uh, attempt to remediate that, provide them with a pull request, they merge the pull request, goes back around the loop, and the finding that we found previously has now been resolved. So I use Customize. I really love that tool. I, I, I keep things as bare bones as possible. So I've got a bunch of folders with YAML in it. It's not until I run Customize do I have a complete sort of, you know, namespace deployment services. So are you running, <clears throat> I, and people have a lot of magical tools out there to do this kind of stuff. So are you running these tools as well to get a complete YAML picture for an environment? So it's interesting you mentioned Customize. So Customize is our first use case because in terms of consistent tooling, it's probably the most complicated one, right? You've got the, I just dump all my deployments in all my environment folders. Uh, and away we go. Uh, so we are actually targeting customized first. We, you in your repository have to provide a single file in the root of that repository called a ksoc.yaml file. That tells us the cluster that, uh, the directory, sorry, that we should be targeting and the customized command that we should be executing to understand what your, you know, how we build your clusters landscape essentially. So we execute that. We look for the diff or we, f we figure out what the diff is and then we construct a customized patch. So all of our customized patches sit in a customized patches.yaml file. Um, so from a pull request perspective, it's very easy because you're only ever looking at a diff in one file. Um, we're not going to try and be clever because obviously in customize you can use the concept of a base and then many overrides per cluster um, or per environment. We're not going to be, we're not, to try and be clever and make decisions on whether we should do that in your top level base customization because if your finding is in your sandbox cluster it may or may not be in your production cluster um and also as well as that you as a user may not even have the ability to be able to merge production pull requests for example or you may need further levels of approval so we're being quite targeted right now on where the patches are located yeah, all right, two more questions before we get, I, I want to get into your past. Um, that's what this podcast is really about. I got two more questions. Have you seen that um, the Qlang programming language, Q, which is helping to kind of solve some of these problems? Are you, have, are you doing any, okay, you have seen Q. Are you using Q at all for this, or is Q really not something that's can leverage? So we are, we are not using Q um, at, at the moment. So to kind of set the scene of where we're at, um, we are, we've been kind of building out the product. So I, I joined uh, a couple of months into when KSOC actually got established. We've been going for about, I think it's four or five months now. Um, we've got a couple of core kind of feature sets that we're going after this being probably the main one. Um, there's a couple of others. Um, so we have to be quite specific on what we're targeting. So we are targeting auto remediation with customize in a GitOps repository, but we are allowing it to be flexible enough for other languages to be chosen um, and us to be able to deploy uh, or pull down those packages at a specific version that you're leveraging and execute the commands. So how we can extend this is in your customized YAML um, file, you provide us the command to execute to build your environment rather than just the directory. Because right now we just do customize build directory. And we know that it's very simplistic because you're running customize. If that's not the case, then provide us the command that we need. Then we can maybe need to extend that further and say what version of the package are you using so that we get even more information. Um, and then we can, as long as we can build out your environment, we have a way to be able to establish this. And I think we can, once we've got one, one loop, we can iterate further and bring in different languages and different frameworks um, to be able to uh, accommodate different use cases. Yeah, I, I guess you have best practices for all the different options and settings and uh, that you're looking for. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. So we have quite an extensive rules engine, um, and a you know we have a, a a small team that's working on building more and more rules. Um, we're also building out the ability for you to bring out bring your own custom rule set. So uh, you you as a customer have your own rule set that's very specific to you. You need to label every deployment with a certain value, as an example. Um, you can bring that along. And we will even tag the report. We will create a pull request that adds the labels to where they needed to be, need to be added. Um, right now, like you said, we're targeting customize. There's no reason why we can't cost, why we can't target kind of Helm charts and go, and go even further in that in that. So tighten that loop even more if you're leveraging a Helm chart. Um, so yeah, the kind of the the feature set is endless at the moment, um, but we're being kind of um, very tightly scoped on the focus that we're going after. Yeah, I, I'm the developer you don't like because I like to really minimize the restrictions of my local dev environment because I just don't want to be slowed down, especially early on in a project. Once things are super stable, I don't mind making my local environment closer to, say, staging and production. But I don't want to be—I don't want to lose an hour because I had a bad setting and it, and I didn't know. So one of the things that we we've we've thought about you as the, as the you know as the annoying developer. Um, so <laughs> we are th we are thinking and uh, considering the best way to approach that. So is that an annotation on your deployment that kind of overrides the the the, the rules executor running because you've basically turned it off very like at a very specific deployment level, or uh, you can enable KSOC or disable KSOC at a, direct, at a whole directory if you want to. Um, so you could just say ignore and then it's an array of directories. And if your file exists in that, we're just not even going to process it. Um, so yeah, there's, there's ways of kind of being the annoying developer, I guess. It's the networking for me, dude. The networking is so complex and so mind boggling that when I'm running Kubernetes locally, it's a simple cluster, single pod, no replicas. Everything's open all the way to the machine, like, <clears throat> like you know, like the networking is what what drives me crazy. I I, I want to go to school for it at some level, but it's that's the stuff that I really just open up completely, which is probably where a lot of security issues <laughs> end up being related, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Secu like 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 everyone says, like security is like an onion. It just depends upon what you're t what you're tackling. Right now, you know, we've gone with probably. The easiest of the of the onions, which is the you know, which is the the configuration of your Kubernetes YAML. We've got to get to the network. We've got to get to the you know the the infrastructure. So if you're running in the cloud, what does your kind of what does your overall account look like? What is your what does your top level EKS cluster look like? There's there's multiple levels to this, um, but the one where we currently see the most value is you know, what are you, how are you configuring the workloads that are running inside your cluster? And then we'll kind of go outward from there. So we're starting at the core rather than starting at the edge and going in. Security for me is about how much um, frustration I want in my life sometimes. It's like, I hate two-factor authentication. I hate it. I know I need it, but it is so annoying because it slows me down, right? And so it's like, how much of this disruption do you want in your life? That's how secure you, you are allowed to be. Yeah, and I think that's where this where this auto remediation piece really comes in, right? You, you prime example of yourself, right? You're saying I, I don't really care. I need I need this all this security stuff to just get out my way, so it can get it can get out your way, and then we'll we'll do the we'll do the pull requests to fix the problem. So there'll be a couple there'll be there may be a lot of pull requests, but having to figure out where the change needs to be made is the thing that takes the most time, or even knowing that you need to make it in the first place. Um, and that's both, at, I think, at a developer level, but also at a security engineer level, right? There's, there's so, to your point, there's so many pieces of the Kubernetes puzzle that you can't possibly know all of them. Um, and people target one specific area, like a developer cares about the application. But when you're a security person, you, you, there's so many layers, you can't possibly know them all in depth. So the hope is that this, the KSOC with the operation center will be able to you know, become an opinionated Kubernetes security engineer um, that is doing the majority of the heavy lifting and trying to remove the fatigue off of the security engineer and get out of the way of the developer, but hopefully come to some kind of happy medium. And I guess the idea is I'm going to pay you, and I guess the idea is I'm going to pay you to monitor these repositories 
So when I hire somebody or I make another a mistake, it's caught uh, fairly quickly. Exactly, yeah. And then the other the other feature that we are currently working on is a uh, a role based access controller RBAC visualization and um, so a, a visualizer of what your current RBAC landscape looks like within your cluster, but also uh, a way of being able to tell when you change a specific component in your RBAC landscape, what impact that's actually going to have. Because again, RBAC is, is, is complex. You know, you can make it very, very complex or you can make it very, very simple. Um, but because Kubernetes doesn't really have the understanding of users, it's kind of hidden away. So we're trying to bring users to the forefront when you view RBAC. So what can Steve Wade do as an example? And if the, you've, you've changed this cluster role binding over here that doesn't have Steve Wade immediately completely attached to that because Steve Wade actually sits in a group and you've, you've defined a group in your, um, in your cluster role binding. So when you make that change, this is what's actually gonna happen to Steve Wade. He's no longer gonna be able to do this, this and this but you are going to allow him to do X, Y, and Z. And I think that's, that's going to become extremely important because not, there's no one in the companies that, that I've been in, the companies that we're currently talking to, there's no one that really kind of owns that RBAC landscape. It comes very much down to let's do something that's really, really simplistic. And we'll deal with it. We'll deal with it when the security attack happens and then we'll, we'll tighten the screws. <laughs> okay. This, I, I, we, I, we're going to get back to this. We're going to get back to this. But I, I, I really want to kind of get a, uh, kind of your journey to how you are where you are today with all this kind of Kubernetes security stuff that you're doing. I'm assuming, did you grow up in England? Where did you grow up, Steve? I did grow yeah. I, I've born and bred. All right, so you finished, in, in England, you still like, you finished that, you finished your grade schooling then still at around 17 18 before you have an opportunity to, to go to university, right? So what year, so what year is it when you are like 17, 18? Just give everybody a sense of what tech was like. So when I was seven or 18, I need to do the math now. When did you kind of graduate from say grade school or had the opportunity to start university? So I graduated in 2010. Um, from from university. All right, university. Okay, all right. That gives me a good uh, where I want to be. Okay, perfect. So here's my first question, Steve. I want you to, the first thought or memory that pops into your head of you working on a computer, of that first thought, and kind of how old were you when uh, for this memory? So I was probably eight years old, um, and I remember jumping on a computer that my dad it was actually a laptop of my father's um and i was just intrigued what he was doing because i just saw loads of what was what now i know is code but at the time just looked like you know a load of random letters on a screen with a couple of characters and i was like what on earth is this stuff like how, how can you kind of explain it to me how this how this whole process works um and I was just very intrigued and inquisitive. Like I've always been very inquisitive from a young age. Like I would always ask, like we'd be going on a long car journey and I'd want to know in detail how the seatbelt actually worked or how the indicator functioned. Um, so I saw this, this code block and I think it was written in Ada or some kind of programming language like that. I can't remember the exact, um, the exact language. And my dad was stepping me through this function of what it was actually doing. Um, and then I was noticing things like capital and lowercase letters. So I was asking why, why in some letter, why in some words, when you've combined two words together, why are some of them uppercase and some of them lowercase? Like, is there a reason for that? Um, because when we write English, we have spaces between them. So I'm saying, why have you not got spaces between your words? Why are the words kind of condensed? And it was just fascinating to, to realize that there was this whole other world that you don't get taught when you're a child. Like you don't really even get taught that at college or, or, um, or maybe at college you did, but when, when we we're at school, we never really got much time in front of a computer. It was always, you need to think about your elocu elocution lessons. It's hilarious that I can't even say elocution. Um, and your handwriting lessons, you need to focus on them. And I think when I was a child, one of the things that I, if I was a kid now, 
I would, you know, I would gravitate naturally towards a computer because I think it's such an important skill to have. And the ability to be able to type or touch type is an incredible skill in today's world. And I think that was completely missing. So when I started looking at this code, I really wanted to get in front of the keyboard and I just wanted to start tapping keys because it's something that I'd never done before. And I just found this machine that my dad was sitting in front of just incredible Um, because I I was used to textbooks and having to write with a fountain pen. Was your dad a software developer? Was he an engineer? Yeah, he was a, he was an, yeah, he was an engineer. Um, so he, he started up a new file and we just started, I just started tapping on the keyboard. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm typing code as if I'm writing English with spaces all over the place. And then I'm trying to ask him why there's a random equals sign. Like what does, what's, what's equals, like what's all this about? And then he tells me about variables and then we move from we move from variable declaration to changing variables, and then we move to some loops. Um, Steve, this is wait, wait, I want, I, I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you a little bit here and there as we go because your memory is so vivid here at, at eight years old. I, it's mind blowing to me. Like, not that my memory is great, but I mean, this is really vivid. This had a, a major impact. Yeah, it 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 did because I so if we back up a bit I was playing football um and football was my soccer was my main love and passion this is all I ever wanted to do was play I wanted to be a professional footballer and if we if we go forward and we can talk about this that actually happened um but I always knew that that was never going to be the end game right you watch professional footballers you see they have an injury they never come back and play football again so I needed to have something to lean back on and my my parents were very uh they had very strong opinion on the fact that i always needed to have a backup so i needed to have my education my education was really important okay but wait wait i'm gonna interrupt i'm gonna interrupt you at what age at what age okay so i'm gonna stop you for a second i want i want to get to this part of the story here so as you're getting into high school it sounds like football is still your big focus you must have been you must have been playing on a on the city team or some form of a travel team you were you were playing at an elite level and in high school you're thinking I'm going to be a football player but at what age is your brain being reasonable and rational that I need a backup plan so it's not at eight scouted, years old I, I was scouted at six so at I six was playing, yeah I was oh, playing academy wow. level football at six years old so I am one of the things that they teach you is the they call it football school. And I've talked about this to friends and people before. And it's about the, the darker side of football, the things that you don't really hear about in the media. Um, you just see them happen and they just get publicized, which is, you know, gambling as a prime example, drug addiction. Um, and they had ex players that would come and talk to you. Bear in mind, they're not talking to me at six years old because I'm not going to know what on earth they're talking about. Um, but my my parents were always like, go out, have fun, um, play football, but your education is just as important. If your education slips, then there's con- then with, there's going to be consequences with your football. Um, and I, re- I remember that at, at school, I got very bored. My mind was ne- my mind was always thinking about football. But when I got in front of this computer, my mind just was, I was just all in. Like everything else was not important at that time. I I just found the whole thing fascinating because it was something brand new. To me, it's like, it's like uh, going to another continent that you've never been to before and kind of experiencing something brand new and you kind of being completely out of your comfort zone. That's how I felt when I sat at the laptop. Um, And I just wanted to dive in. I wanted to understand everything about it. And then as soon as I kind of scratched that itch, uh, the following day, I remember like N plus one now of my dad coming home and I just saying, can we do some more stuff like on on the keyboard? Um, I didn't know what on earth I was talking about. Um, And that passion kind of started from there. Um, And I, I knew that the the main um subjects that i was learning at school they were just going to get me ticks on this tick list if that makes sense um to make me get to the next stage in my career or the next level of education but seeing that i could sit in front of a computer 
potentially after my career or maybe if my career never happens at this point and being able to almost do whatever I want it's like a blank piece of paper and I can construct and create whatever I want as long as I stick to these set of principles I just found fascinating like I was never really great at at written English like I couldn't write stories um but being able to write some code and hit the hit the run button and see some stuff printing back to the screen it was just a fascinating experience um and that that's why it's so vivid to me so how much of this but how much of this did you do in high school i i imagine at, by the time you're in high school by the time you're 15 16 17 14 through i mean football is all consuming at that point if you're playing at that level so where do you find time and how do you find time to work on the computer during the high school years or you just don't so so we had special dispensation so the 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 football clubs were able to take the kids out of school as long as the kids still uh did the classwork and completed the curriculum so i always talk about it as i i've been on a football hamster wheel and i've been on the corporate hamster wheel uh, and i basically the corporate hamster wheel I can get off at weekends if I'm lucky. The football hamster wheel I never really got off um, because I was doing schoolwork when kids were asleep um, to kind of make sure that I was still up to speed. Um, I was doing I was doing homework a week like a couple like a week or two weeks before it needed to be due in so that I could give myself the flexibility that I needed to keep my my football career and en and en enjoyment going. And in in terms of how much time I got to spend on on the keyboard the keyboard or or kind of coding in general wasn't really a thing for me until i was about 15 in in education anyway so i went to college and chose information technology i was never really in front of a keyboard um in in day-to-day -day education outside of day-to-day -day education when i could mostly at weekends with my father that's when i spent and learned a lot about writing code and you know the, the bare bones of what makes a good program um, error logging, et cetera, et cetera. So when, when, you're, when you're near the end of high school, right, and, and, and it's this choice now of what to do next in life, you decided to go to university and not stick with the football? So I had a terrible knee injury uh, at the age of 18, which essentially ruined my football career, if I'm, if I'm being honest with myself. Um, that took me to a dark place um and i i wanted to get back into football um but the way that the club i'm, I'm not going to name the club but the way the club treated me at the time was not the best um you there's there's stories about similar things happening um about people being let go essentially because of an injury they had it was completely my fault the reason why the injury occurred it was against the contract I shouldn't have been playing football at the time. I got a very bad knee injury. They tore up the contract and said, you're no longer going to be a footballer. So the, or you're no longer going to be a footballer with us. And now I'm 18 and I'm kind of at this crossroads, which is, do I go again? Do I rehab myself and go again? Um, and try and push myself forward and keep going down that route? Or do I scratch the itch that I've been scratching for a while even harder and see if I can really make a go of it? Um, so. All of the time that I spent doing football, I just like when I w when I got released, I just switched all the same amount of time in terms of hours into computing, and I just raced as fast as I could. So I, I was doing things at college that we shouldn't have been learning at college because I'd already gone past the college curriculum because I was just. All right, hold, hold on, hold on. Don't don't get too far ahead of me for a second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You know, I had a friend who played major league baseball. He was a pitcher. He hurt his shoulder. And they didn't want to know anything from him at that point. Here's a guy playing in the show, hurt your, hurt the rotator cup, and next, right? Like just so I've heard these stories before at the at the level that you're playing. Like you almost feel like you're just uh, you're a tool or something until you're broken, and then it's like next next person up. It's it's exactly. wild. Exactly. Uh, luckily, he did finish his university degree in finance and was fine, you know, after baseball. So it, it sounds like at that point, you make a decision that you're going to go to university to study computer science, right? But are your <clears throat> talk? Yeah, so 
How long was high school over when this happens? Was it while you were still in high school, so that transition to university was kind of seamless, or had you already been out? No, I was. I never left education when I was playing soccer or, or football. Um, I was always still there. Um, so school is um, what you guys would call high school. Then you go to college. Then you go to university. Then you go into the, the real world and in inverted commas. So when I got released, I was at college. Um, so I had a year to really ramp myself up, um, and kind of flick the switch and get myself ready to go to university. And at this point, I knew now if I put the amount of dedication that I put into soccer and I put it into computing and I got sat in front of a computer, I knew that I could do it. Um, I was already doing, I was already doing, uh, IT at college. Um, and I just, I went all in, I wanted every programming language. I wanted front end. I, I just wanted to see the spectrum and, and essentially consume myself in this ecosystem, uh, not realizing actually how massive it was um, and how much of a rabbit hole I could go down. Um, but at this point, it was for me before I went to college, before I went to university, the idea was to get as much baseline understanding of IT as I possibly could, so that when I was at university, I could start to make decisions and start to you know uh move towards a focus area so if that was going to be networking if that was going to be application development uh what that was going to be um and what university did you end up choosing to go to at th at that point so i the university that i went to i went to university of portsmouth um which was extremely close to my parents or relatively close to my parents house um reason being is I, I wanted to be able to at this point I wanted to be able to come home still going through the you know the 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 repercussions of being let go uh having my brother near me having my parents near me having some of my my friends near me was it was important and and going com like so far away that I was again in my own bubble I didn't think at that point in time was the best decision to make um so I I took a uh not not a high-end university um, but a university that allowed me to um, to come home when I needed to um, easily and not have to do a huge commute. So there was a little bit of sacrifice there, but it was the, it was the right sacrifice to make. And again, for me, um, the the university degree is another tick on the box, another tick in the box to get you into the corporate world. Right. You get you get ahead of the, the, the person that doesn't go to university and then you've got to really prove yourself. So for me, it was getting the best grades that I could get at university. And then as soon as I get into the corporate, the corporate world and, and go and get jobs, that's when I've really got to go, you know, hell for leather and really start to, to ramp that up. Um, so, I, so when you're at university, are you, I'm assuming your knee gets better, not enough to play professional, but are you at least still playing intramurals? Are you playing recreational? Yeah, so I'm playing. For, I'm playing university team, playing for the university team. Um, at that point, I was looking at doing. Um, so I was continuing with my coaching. I, I always wanted to stay if I could. Never really happened that well, um, but I always wanted to stay somewhere close to football. Um, even with IT, now I've kind of flicked the switch, and IT being my main focus. Um, but always, always having that route back um, if I needed to in in some capacity. Um, so yeah, I was I was still playing. I played um, for the for the IT um, department. They had a football team. There was a main university football team. There's actually many um, university football teams at that point. I was um, I was playing for them, but my my knee was kind of like glass. It could it could go again at any time. Um, and kind of rolling back a bit, the the rehabilitation that I got was obviously as best as it could be on free healthcare with the, with the NHS here in the UK. Um, I, I could have paid for private if I wanted to, I probably should have, um, looking back in hindsight, but I was, I was fine. Like everything that I, you know, I ticked all the boxes again at the, at the physio appointment. Um, I could squat 120 kilos, eight reps, no knee pain, perfectly fine. Um, but if I ran straight forward and had to make a very sharp turn to the left, 
I could, you know, when you just feel it and you're like, hmm, this, this could go. Yeah, any I've played enough sports so, where you just, yeah. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm bandaged up every day, every game, every training session. Like you, you think that I was, you know, I was actually going to play rugby, but I wasn't, I was just walking on a soccer field. Um, and I was, I never went a hundred percent. I would say I went 70%, maybe 75% some days, but I'd never give it, I never give it my all um, because I knew that my IT career was more important than being able to play soccer. Um, and you probably didn't have to on that field with those players. Your 70% was probably more than enough. Yeah. So, yeah. So they, the playing soccer is actually less about skill and more about your brain and how quickly you can make decisions and how quickly you can think and uh, like geographically where you locate yourself on the field at any, at any moment in time. And when you're playing with people that have not played at the level that I was lucky enough to play at, their brain is not as quick. So I can, I can, outs, I can outspeed them with movement rather than execution and running um, by just being in, the, being in the, uh, the correct position. Yeah, it's wild. I, I'm going to have to watch a soccer game. My, my wife is a big soccer fan. She's, she was born and raised in Colombia. I don't understand that game. So if there's a soccer game going on and I watch it with her, she's always like screaming. I'm like, what are you seeing? What are you seeing? What are you seeing? <laughs> you know, like, it's wild to me um, that she, you know, you have that vision of the game. I, I don't have it. All right, let's get back to university. What did you end up majoring in? You know, what did you kind of, kind of fall in love with um, as you progress through university? So I... I was always into coding. Like I scratched that itch at eight years old and I kind of just went for it. Um, I, I floated with networking, but as you said, networking is, you know, you, you've got to put down everything else and then pick up networking. Uh, you, you can't really do that, but do half of that and half of something else. Um, and I was pretty good at maths when I was at school and I found coding very similar to like, you know, completing maths equations. Um, depending upon what code you're writing sometimes you're trying to figure out what the equation is yourself other times you're just trying to you know execute the code to 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 uh to prove the equation out when you're writing a test as an example um so coding was my natural kind of direction of travel um i'd already had that bias at the beginning um but i I, at university, we did a number of courses in kind of vectors and maps and arrays and queues and stacks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I knew that I could use them in my coding. So everything was naturally kind of gravitating back towards coding. And when I was kind of ramping up uh, myself after um, being released, I spent a lot of time coding because that was just the thing that I found most interesting. Um, what language? What languages were you coding? Um prior and in university what were there's a java c what, what are they teaching at that time so i was with my father i was doing c um and at university i was doing we were doing dot net we did a bit of uh haskell i don't know if you're familiar with haskell um we were doing some haskell but c sharp so you were doing a c sharp in university in 2008 9 10 yeah yeah, .NET. Wow. Not Java. That's the first time I've heard that. I, I did. I wrote C Sharp for 10 years, so I, I never yeah, heard anyone was, say they were doing a university. Yeah, it's interesting to me as well now in the position that I'm in and people that are coming out of university, Java seems to be you know, top of the list, if not equivalent to, to kind of .NET development. But I don't know why at the time the university chose, chose .NET development over Java. Um, but alas, that's what they, uh, that's what they went with. Well, I was doing Pascal and C in university back in the late 80s. So, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, that just changes yeah, Pascal over time. Yeah, uh, Pascal, was, Pascal was there as well. So as you're nearing the end of um, university, right, we're in 2010, I guess your brain now says, okay, I'm going to go get a job. So what's the process of you finding that first job at a university? So... So one of the reasons why I chose the university that I chose is because they have this concept of what's called a placement year. So you do two years at university, you have an optional placement year, which is essentially where they help you go out and spend the year in industry. And then you come back and do your final year. And I knew how important that 
placement year was going to be because looking at the CV that I had at the time, not much to it. A lot of, a lot of football, not a lot of, um, going out there in the wild. I was writing a lot of programs for myself. Um, and I knew that that year was going to be extremely important to my development and it was going to set me up. It's kind of the foundations of what it's going to be like after university, like university, you, you, you're in this bubble, right? You go to, go to lecture rooms, you sit in front of the computer, you type away some code. It's not, it's not realistic to, to what you're going to be dealing with. There, there's a social side of it as in engineering that you cannot teach at university. Um, you can teach the engineering at university, but you can't teach the social side. Um, so I, I knew that I had to get out to industry and a number of, um, companies that were partnered with the university came and you, you wrote your CV, you wrote a covering letter and you sat down with them and you basically told them your story, um, where you'd come from, your background, what you're interested in, what you'd like to do. Um, and I was having this kind of conversation with them that we're having now. Um, and I was saying that. This is the reason why I want to get out in industry. I really want to spend uh, time on the the social side. Like I, I'm, I'm pretty confident in myself that I can write code. It may not be the best code because I'm still learning, but I, I'm confident in that. What I'm not so confident in is how do I deal with other people in a in a team in an engineering capacity. I was I knew that I could do that in a football capacity. I knew that I could, you know, I was a, I was a good I was a good team player. I was sub captain. Um, I could build relationships with um, with my teammates, but could I do it in a technical capacity? And I, I, I as well, I found that whole thing very interesting. So, I, I wait a second, wait a second. Well, I, I find it fascinating that you are in university more worried about interacting with people than you are the tech. Where, where is that coming from? Why are you so? I don't get the sense that you had issues relating and interacting with people. Uh, where, where is that coming from? I think there's a now 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 I don't. Um, but when when I was at university, I was again in in that bubble, and I'm not I'm not dealing with people as 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 bad as it sounds. I'm I'm not dealing with people in suits, right? I'm not dealing with people in upper management. I don't know how to talk to upper management. Put me in front of a tech person that's we're writing a piece of code and we're pair programming. I'd be okay with that. But how do I deal with a product manager? Well, I've never had a product manager. How do I deal with a tester? Well, I've never had a tester because I'm the one that's writing the tests. So those kind of interactions and how I deal with them in, a, in an engineering team capacity was where my concern was because that was completely out com outside my comfort zone. Um, and I knew that it's, you can be a very good engineer and you could be an introverted engineer or you could be an extroverted engineer as well and be able to you know, go into different areas. and during that year, um, I'm sure we'll come on to that in a second, but during that year, what was very interesting to me is I spent a lot of time on conference calls because the team that I was put in was actually completely remote. So there was no one in my team that was geographically in the same, even the same country as me. They were all dispersed, Asia, Australia, um, America and Europe. So I've now gone from like zero to 100 because I'm now I, I now am worried about um, interacting with testers and product managers, even in the same building around the table. And now I'm doing it. I'm not even at a table. I'm just on my computer. Um, so I, that relationship building was interesting as well, because that, that, that becomes a little bit more difficult as well. You can't you can't take them out for a coffee. You can't have a you know, can't have a dinner with them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so one of the things maybe two years in no two months into my placement year is I just wanted to quit I just said to, I remember um going back to my parents house and they were like how, how are you finding um what you're doing and I was like I don't like it um I'm, I'm not getting out of it what I wanted to get out of it um I want to build these interactions and learn how to how to interact with with different areas of the business um and I remember going into the, the company and sitting down with the HR lady that was dealing with um the the relationship with the university and she was like whatever you do you can't really leave um it's gonna it's gonna build a, a negative relationship between us and the university let me come back to you um and come up with an idea so kind of fast forward one week she's saying well how about I put you on a plane and you go and spend a bunch of time with each of them. And I was like, 
dang, okay, where do you want, where do you want to go first? And now they're all over the place. Japan, Brazil, Australia, um, Florence in Italy, Germany, uh, the US. So now I'm like, okay, well, I can't really say no because this is an even bigger opportunity than I ever thought I was going to get. So next thing you know, fast forward another week, I'm on a plane to Indianapolis and Chicago and I'm spending three months there and I'm living with a person that I've only, I've, you know, I've, I've met maybe three or four times on a, on a, you know, on a conference call. Um, they didn't want to put me in a hotel because they didn't think that was fair. They wanted me to kind of uh, immerse myself with um, with other people. And I went around the whole team. So I've been to each country. I've spent, you know, America was the most. I spent a couple of weeks in, in other locations. Um, and then I came back to the the UK headquarters and... I had to present. They wanted me to give a presentation of all of the things that I'd done and what I'd learned. And it was it was an incredibly empowering experience being given the opportunity to do that in the first place and then actually talk to like at this point I think there was like 350 people in the room. I'd never really given a public speak like a a, a talk before. Um to talk about all of the things that I'd gone through. So I, I kind of played the story back when I was playing football and then all the way up to the present moment of me being in this room, doing a talk for the first time in front of, you know, 350 people. Wait, 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 let me interrupt you for a second. That's wild. Like they, I wonder if you were like a guinea pig for this, this program, especially if you then have to present to 350 people. Had they done this sort of thing before? I, I wasn't sure. So at this point, they'd given me such an opportunity that I couldn't really say no to anything until the day that I left. That's kind of what I felt. Um, they were like, are you sure you want to do it? And no, couldn't really leave my mouth, even though I was thinking to myself, that's a hell of a lot of people that I'm about to stand in front of and talk to. And, you know, I'm creating slides on uh, on PowerPoint. I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, and I thought I went back to that time when I got released from playing football. And I thought to myself, all I ever wanted to do was get opportunities. Like I was just an opportunity grabber at this point. And I'm being able to present in front of that many people at, at such a young age and not really being an in industry. I was only in industry at this point, what was kind of pretend industry because I was getting shielded um, for, for now coming on, I think it was eight, uh, 10 months. And I thought, if I, if I land this well, this is going to set me up really well i can always come back to this and talk about this in the future um, about this experience so now people that i've met in all of those countries are now people that when i go to those countries i make a beeline to go and see them every time i go to the us i go i i always come in to indianapolis or i'm coming into uh, chicago i'm spending two or three days with these people um, and then i'm going to my end destination but even your working relationship after that right? Completely changed because now you had relationships with everyone. It wasn't just some random person in front of a screen. D yeah, definitely. And, and being able to, to see the, to have conversations with people that you don't want to have in the four walls, four walls of an office, going out for dinner with them, asking them their, ex you know, getting their experience, getting their, you know, those little seeds of knowledge that you get about how, how do you like a developer to interact with you when you're a tester? How do you like a developer to interact with you when, when you're a project manager, what kind of things, if I wanted to be a project manager, would I be looking at? And I, it was, it was a great opportunity to sit on the other side. So I was a developer in the team, but at that point when I was, you know, in, in Brazil with the product manager, I became a project manager for a week because I just wanted to see what it was like, figure it all out, work out what he was doing. Um, and yeah, it's, it set me up. You know, I'm 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 blessed and grateful for the opportunity that I had in that one year. It was it, I didn't want to do it. If I'm honest with you, I remember explicitly uh, crying my eyes out in front of my mum and dad when they dropped me off at the airport, saying, "I don't think this is what I want to do because I'm about to take a an eight and a half hour flight to the middle of nowhere and go and live with someone that I've I've never actually met before." Um, but I remember my dad saying to me that, that about three or four minutes before I went through security, he said, whatever you do in the next three or four months, never say no. And that like stuck with me for the rest of my life. Um, 
never saying no to opportunities, never turning them down. Um, thinking about, you know, there's, there's risk and reward. You've got to make calculated risks. Um, but at the age that I was at, I, w I, I had no reason not to say yes. You know, I didn't have a family. I didn't have kids. I, you know, there was no, I, I wasn't paying for a house. I wasn't paying for a car. Um, I was, I was on the, the grabbing of opportunities essentially was what I was doing. Um, I, I, I love the story. I love the story. I love it. I, I just had to do this with the 14 year old a month ago where everything was no, 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 no. I made her watch the movie. Yes, man. Have you ever seen the movie? Yes, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I made her watch it. And then I told her today, you're going to say yes five times where you would have had said no. Right. I, 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 I love that story. Yeah, I think, and, and ever, to be honest with you, it stuck with me from my first ever job. I, I've only, I've left previous roles when I feel like I'm not learning enough. Yeah, no, no, don't, don't, don't go there just yet. Let, let's stay, let's right, stay here. Right. So, so you now graduate university. You've got all this experience now on your CV. You've got not just work experience, life experience. As you graduate university, where do you, how do you find that first job? Is it with the same company you've been interning with or you decide to go do something else? No, it was not. Um, so I had the opportunity to go back. Um, and and go back to the same team and and continue to build those relationships. And I thought, I have I have I have those people in my life. I know that I can always lean on them. That, that those relationships are built. Um, you know, I can keep those relationships going. Um, but I wanted to at this point, I wanted to take myself out of my comfort zone. So I remember explicitly when I was back at university, I, I made the decision that I would go to university close to home. So now I thought in my first job, I'm going to take, I'm going to take a job in the city. So I'm going to go and work in London. Long commute to my family's house. If I want to go back and see my parents, going to be on my own, going to be staying with someone that I actually met at university, um, that we were actually playing in the football team together. And I went and stayed in this house, um, rented a, rented a room and kind of, uh, went and did .NET development, uh, for, for an estate agency. And at this point, it's, it's slightly easier from a engineering standpoint, because now everyone's in the same room, everyone's around the same table. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm just embracing myself, sorry, embracing the situation at this point. So now the, the thing that I'm learning about is how do I deal with time on my own? So I'm very, I'm, I know that I'm okay in the corporate world. I know I can deal with people. I can speak to people. I can interact. Now, what do I do from five to nine rather than from nine to five? What do I do with that massive amount of time? You know what? Let me, let me interrupt you for a second because it just occurred to me that when you were in that football program, they basically set your schedule from the time you woke up, from the time you went to sleep. You didn't really get to make decisions on any of that. And even, I guess, in university, you defined a schedule for yourself that was pretty rigid. And now you only have to work your 40 hours a week, so you don't have anything to fill in the gaps, right? So you're feeling kind of lost here. Yeah, or I'm thinking, actually, do I, do I use the time and get even further ahead and, and learn more stuff? But that, there's a slippery slope there where you can, re, where you can get to burnout. Right, because you're spending so much time in front of a computer that you're not seeing anything else. And then, and then, I was very nervous about going back to being introvert, like or or, or looping back to being an introvert, um, and not wanting to. I definitely didn't want to be that kind of person. Um, from what I'd been playing football, I was very much extrovert. So I had to have something that filled that gap. So at that point, luckily enough, the the gentleman that I was staying with, who um, who was who I met at the, in the football team was a personal trainer so i spent my time going to the gym and i he actually helped me rehab my knee um back to something much better than i've ever had it before um so i i embraced that i embraced an, a, you know a, a good meal plan i was prepping my food i was you know i had enough stuff to keep me busy from kind of 5 p.m till maybe 10 10 30 and because i was learning so much and i was kind of a, a you know, a knowledge sponge between the hours of nine to five, I was getting pretty tired. So I had, I had something that was 
Wait, 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 wait. But you're in London. Like, you're not going out at Friday at five o'clock and having pints and interacting on the street with, with rent. Like, that's one of the things I love about London, right? Like, five o'clock, everybody's out having a pint after work. Just, yeah, just kind of chilling. Yeah, we were, we would, we were doing that. Um, we were using, I was using that as the, as the time to socialize with, with colleagues and other members of team, oh, sorry, uh, people from other teams that I, I don't interact with on a, on a daily basis. Um, but that was, that's only the Friday, right? You've still got the Monday to Thursday that we've got to fill, fill the time with. Um, and then sometimes on, on the Friday, I would travel back maybe once a month to see my family or the other way around, they'd come up and see me and we'd go and do something, um, so yeah, the the going and standing on a on a street corner outside of a pub is still something that I love to do. It's it's one of the main reasons why I actually miss going to conferences. But I'm sure we're going to come onto that at some point. Um, that that social interaction is extremely important. So so how long are you at this job? You're doing C sharp development. You you start there. I'm guessing around 2010 2011. How long are you at this first job? Uh, a year and a year and two months. The reason kind of why I left was because I had an opportunity come up that would allow me to kind of move into a more of a consultancy role um, and be even more customer facing than what I was at that time. At that time, there was no such thing as customer facing, really, because our, our customers were uh, were the, um, the people that were selling the houses, like the estate agents. Um, but I wanted to now put myself in another situation whereby my clients were other companies. So I'm now kind of, I'm level, I'm essentially trying to level myself up a little bit. Um, so still doing, uh, .NET development, but now I'm working with other companies. So I'm going on site, I'm having site meetings. I'm going with account, um, account managers from my company to, to other companies. Um, and I'm now getting the chance to see how things are done differently. I had a very narrow, uh, a very narrow focus or a, narrow, or a lens on how to do .NET development in the corporate world because I'd only ever seen it for a year and I'd only ever seen it in one place. So now I'm, I'm going to different companies. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm scratching the, uh, the extrovert itch because I'm going on company. I'm going to company sites. I'm having meetings with people that I've never met before, but I'm also, still coding because I'm, I'm the developer at this point. I'm working with a small team. Um, I was a developer um, for, for one year in a team. Then I went to leading the team after the first year. So now I've got kind of people beneath me um, that, are, you know, that are helping me write the code. And now I've got the ability and I've been lucky enough at this point to see different domains. And now I'm thinking, what kind of domain do I want to go in? Um, and I, I always knew that I kind of wanted to lean towards being a consultant because I, I felt that was where I was naturally positioned. Go to dinner like we're talking about, socialize, have those conversations, build those relationships, but also have the technical underpinning that would allow me to be able to bring value to that company um, by working for another one. Yeah. yeah. How long are, are you doing that consulting work? So I was there for two years. Um, and then an interesting story actually about the reason why I left, um, there was, there were two gentlemen at the company that I was working at that had very similar names and he was the account manager for one of the accounts or one of the clients that I was on. So the rate card got sent to me rather than, <laughs> so now I know what I'm worth, but I'm not getting paid anywhere near what I'm worth. You know what you're being billed at. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So now, now yeah. the game is really now the game is kind of completely changed. Um, so I'm getting called into HR. I'm getting called into the into the client team, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and they're trying to explain this to me, and I'm I'm ready to basically just walk at this point. Um, they're they're trying to work out a you know a, a salary that's going to keep me there. Um, and I. I ended up staying, but I made some, some decisions that I wanted to go back and I wanted to spend my whole time on client site. So I essentially wanted to get paid by them, but I didn't want to be anywhere near them. Um, and the reason why I wanted to do that 
it's because I built those relationships and I wanted to continue them. So at this point, I'm now essentially contracting, right? But I'm getting paid a permanent salary, but I'm experiencing, I'm experiencing something like what a contractor or somebody that is self-employed is like, um, without all the paperwork. Uh, so now I'm, now I'm fully, I'm fully in with this company. I'm, I'm in every day, Monday to Friday. I don't, I don't come to their office once a week and have to spend nine till like work a nine till five and then never see them for another kind of five days or seven days. Um, so I'm, I'm working in a team that they were called the life cycle team. And essentially their, their role was to look after every BAU, uh, project that was being run in production. So these guys are seeing literally everything different versions of .NET, different versions of NUnit, different versions of Mock, different versions of absolutely everything. Uh, and I thought to myself uh, at that point, I remember when I was on site and I had some meetings with them, I was like, look, you, you, you've got to start to standardize this. It's, it's like crazy. You can't expect your developers to know all of these different versions of things and have a local development. Like Docker's not really a thing at this point, right? So coming up with a local development environment is not an impossible. They're having to uninstall versions of software and reinstall it to work on another project. Um, and I remember at this point, I, I started to become more of an advisor and a consultant uh, during these nine months that I was on site. So I was actually teaching and mentoring their permanent members of staff, test-driven development, with the latest versions of the tooling and how we could, we, we went through every single application that they run. And it was about 20, I think, um, and upgraded them to the, to the latest versions so that they were all in sync. Um, and then having conversations with external parties to tell them why we were not going to do feature development, because we really needed to standardize and facilitate some kind of blueprint. Uh, because these guys' life was just a living nightmare um, at this point. Um, and I was, yeah, I was there for, I was there for nine months. But they couldn't hire you at the end of the day. The other company would have had to release you or sell you or anything like that. So. C correct. So I, so I left, I left my, my parent company after another, after a nine month stint working full time at, at the other company. Um, and I left and I remember reading my contract and uh, my dad was saying check for the non-compete clause so there was no non-compete clause at this point so i could leave and i could go and work full-time at the company if i wanted to wait and there was no solicitation clause either non-compete would just mean you can stay in the industry the solicitation is the problem yeah sorry that's what i meant um the solicitation yeah there was there was nothing of the sorts so i could theoretically leave on a friday and on the monday morning i could go and roll into their office uh at this point, when I was helping them, I started to scratch the itch of, uh, of continuous integration. So I was at this point, I was really interested in how do we make the deployment easier? Because their deployments, every single one was completely different. Um, and I'm still in the Windows world. So I'm looking at tools like Chocolatey and, and Chef and MS Build and, and GoCD and, and tools like that. Um, and I'm trying to build them pipelines, essentially for them to be able to facilitate nice continuous integration and hopefully get towards continuous delivery. Um, but there was this brick wall. DevOps really wasn't a thing. We could, we could continuously deliver if delivery was just construct the package that was about to get deployed. That was as far as we were ever going to get. Um, so I knew I'd kind of hit a wall. I wasn't going to learn anymore. I wasn't going to be able to do the continuous delivery. I wasn't going to be able to work on the delivery part because I was just going to, I was now, um, in the political spectrum of having to try and liaise with people that were way above my pay grade. Yeah. And you were, you were touching into their territory and everybody gets nervous about their jobs. Like people problems are the worst problems in the world. <laughs> so, so I, I left and I actually went contracting for myself. So now we're at 2014. So I've now, I've now gone out on my own. So I've, I've started my consultancy company. But you had a client to start with, or you just said, that's it, I'm going to go find a client. So, no, I, I just said, I have, 
I, I've built enough relationships over the past couple of years that even if I, you know, my, my, my day rate had, it was ridiculously low. I knew that I didn't want to get stuck in the, in the, in the permanent sphere at this point of, you know, having to do appraisals and, and people pretending that they really cared about your career progression um, and, and having to deal with that. Right. I've, I've dealt with that. I dealt with that at football. It brought a lot of memories back of how we're going to make you the greatest footballer that's ever been. We're going to put you on a ridiculous salary and then you bust your knee and you're, ne- you're, you're to your point, you're next, please. Um, and that's, that's pretty similar. I think in, in IT, I, 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 you know, you are, you are, you know, you can leave and they will get a replacement. You're, no one's indispensable um, in any, in any walk of life. I don't think, um, and I thought to myself, well, I've, I've got, I think, all of the skills that I need to be able to go and do this myself, um, my, minus the actual financing piece and, and dealing with the company and paying taxes and all that kind of nonsense. Um, so I, I just quit and I said, however long it takes me to get a contract, I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to learn what I need to learn. I was continuously delivering my own code that I'd written in C sharp just to a random server. Um, I can't even remember where I was running. Um, using all the tools that I wanted to use in the previous company when I was there. Um, so I had a I had a relatively good idea about what I was doing at this point. I had a I had a good pattern, a good paradigm. And a company I went to an interview, the gentleman was saying, We are, you know, we're we're moving everything. We want to be. We want to become more continuous delivery focused. We're spending too much time doing releases, and I'm thinking, wow, this is like lining up exactly with what I want to do. Um, so, I've gone in there. I'm now working for myself. I don't have, you know, I'm. I now only have myself to blame if this fails. I can't blame anything else. So, I was there for for five months. I built them a continuously and continuous delivery pipeline using all the tools that I was talking about previously. They were shipping, I think 20, I wouldn't call them microservices. They, they may, um, microservices to, to, a to a production environment, um, using this, these tools and these technologies. I was writing the documentation. I became kind of the read me driven developer was the joke that I had, um, when I was there because I just ended up writing everything in a read me because I knew that, I had to leave a legacy that if I ever needed to, you know, get a reference that it was a good legacy um, and documentation is a good legacy because it can actually be read rather than just, you know, looking at, a, you know, what, um, deploying microservices to production. That's, that is great. Um, but knowing that they can always call you and you've always got something to talk against, I think is very important. Um, developers are very good at, at building software. And I think we, we all are, but the thing that, sometimes falls by the wayside is the, is the documentation. And I think that's why like a, a technical writer is such a key skill and something that, you know, every company or every product team, if they could, would, would, would have, because they're just, they're just an incredibly useful, resourceful person um, to be able to write that kind of documentation. And that, that's always the last thing that gets written. Um, but the commute that I was going on, I was driving was, it was long and arduous at this point. And I was, I was getting, leaving very early, getting back very late. Um, and I was, I was getting towards burnout. We haven't yet hit burnout. Burnout comes a little bit later. Um, but something needed to give. And I called up the company that I was, um, no, sorry. I, I got, I received a call from the parent company that I had before that I was working with before. And they said, uh, Company X has got a new project. Uh, they know you know Amazon and you, you've got a rough idea of, of what you're doing. They really like the work that you did previously. It's a brand new project. You can run the project. Um, they'll build a team around you. You can choose some of the people that you want to work with from the previous time that you were there. Uh, what do you think? So I was like, well, this is, this is great. I'm going back to somewhere that I'm comfortable with. I'm getting to lead a team. I'm getting to scratch a couple of new itches that I've never scratched before. So I'm doing more infrastructure level stuff now. So I'm touching on tools like Terraform for the first time um, and, and looking at how we can use code to provision infrastructure before I was writing applications in for loops and if statements. And, and you got to go work for the parent company again where they're billing you out. No, no. So I, I now go and I now cut them out because I'm, um, 
I didn't want to, I, I knew that I had contact directly with the customer at this point. Um, so I said, well, we can cut them out. I can just come and contract directly with you. You can, uh, you know, you, you can waiver the fee that you have to pay, you pay me a little bit more than you paid me before. Um, and I'll come and I'll come and work with you. Um, so, so yeah, I went, did that. I was there for 18 months. Um, and learned Terraform for the first time. They were built, they were rebranding the website essentially. And it was a completely, re, completely new rewrite, uh, completely different technology stack. They, I think they were writing it in, in node, um, calling out to existing APIs. So we, they weren't doing any, um, any backend development in inverted commas. They were kind of consuming APIs that already existed. Um, and at this point I'd, I'd got enough, I had enough freedom that I could start to make some decisions that unfortunately at the time probably um, wasn't what I would do now, but I was now doing CV driven development um, at this point. And now if we go all the way back to when I was in my placement year, the gentleman that I stayed with is now his company that he was working for, which was a startup has now just been bought by Docker. So he's telling me, forget this Windows thing. He's been telling me for a couple of years at this point. He's like, forget this Windows thing, move to Linux. Like Linux is where it's at. It's so much easier. You've got so much better tooling. You can, you know, you can do whatever you want. Oh, and by the way, this container thing. So I, I don't know really what I'm doing, to be perfectly honest. I, I don't, I've never seen a Linux command. Uh, you know, I've never seen a terminal before, um, a Linux terminal, never looked at bash. Um, so I spent a number of evenings with him and he is, uh, he's talking me through what Docker's doing. And I, I remember going back to when I was in this life cycle team and I was thinking like, this would have been incredibly useful when I was in that team. So why am I going to get this company to make the same mistake that they've made? Why don't we just go with Docker? Like it makes perfect sense. So I've now decided that we're running in AWS. We've got a couple of EC2 instances. We've got a load balancer. I've just just dropped Docker Swarm on there like it's like it's nothing. I don't, I'm just executing random commands in the terminal. Um, consoles made its way in there for service discovery. We don't need to discover any services, but it looked cool, and I wanted to work out what it was all about. So that's in there, um, and. I'm I'm working with the with the new website developers building Docker files and constructing the images and trying to work out where we were going to store them. Um, I remember talking to um, or watching a video, sorry, or a conference from Kelsey Hightower, talking about uh, the health Z endpoint and how it's really important and how you needed to have it. So I was telling them all that they should have a health Z endpoint and this is what it should probably do. Um, and we were we were deploying things to Docker Swarm. Um, and it worked great until I wanted to have two containers that were on the same port on the same host and then everything just fell to pieces. And I remember having this conversation with this guy who's now working at Docker and I was like, look, this is, this is a no go, unfortunately, like I, I'm kind of stuck. And he's like, oh, you can just change the port. And I was like, I'm not going to go and tell the developers, by the way, you can only run one instance of your thing. The next time you want another instance, up the port by one. Uh, that's, that's not really going to work. Um, so I was, I was Googling and I came to this Kubernetes thing. And at this point, I think it's like 1.1, 1 .1. uh, deployments aren't even a thing. I think we're at replica, replica sets or replication controllers. I can't remember what the thing was called at the point. Um, so I've stood up a, a test cluster. I've deployed somehow Kubernetes to this thing. I've got an API server, I've got a cube config and I'm somehow executing kubectl commands. Uh, and I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I remember, I think I sent a tweet or I tweeted, what on earth is this Kubernetes thing? It looks incredibly powerful, but can someone please under, like, tell me what this is all about? And I remember I got on a Zoom call, I think it was a Zoom call, or maybe it was a Google Meet with Kelsey Hightower. And he explained Kubernetes to me as a bowl of fruit. And it took me back all the way to when I was sat in front of the computer with my dad and my dad was explaining to me what four loops were. And I just thought, if this is the kind of person that's in this community, this is the community that I really want to get within. It remind, it, it, it's taken me back to the time I was with my dad. He simplified it all down to the bare basics. Um, it was explaining to me what the scheduler was doing and how that was interacting with the API server and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I just kind of went all in on this thing. Um, didn't really kind of know what I was doing. We, we're now deploying kind of 
Kubernetes YAMLs. I'm trying to, I remember going in front of um, developers and trying to explain to them what, you know, what a deployment is and what a pod is and what a po how a pod is not actually a container, even though like three weeks ago, I was telling you that everything you needed to know was a container. Um, <laughs> oh, by the way, can you, can you continue with your website development? And I'm just like upping the levels of complexity and abstraction um, whilst we're there. So uh, at this point, we've now, we've now got Kubernetes running in production, which was just absolutely stupid decision to make, but I learned a heck of a lot. So from a technology standpoint, it was, it was a good thing. Um, but from a decision-making standpoint, it reminded me of um, making sure that I was making calculated risks and not risks that I thought were going to benefit me like short-term and thinking about um, things long-term. Um, and yeah, we were, you know, we were, we were all in on Kubernetes. We were deploying things. We had some, uh, we had some CICD working. We were executing kubectl apply minus F to random YAML files that were stored in their repo from our, from our, um, uh, from our pipeline, CI tooling. Um, and then the kind of corporate door just kind of slammed shut um, because the director that had, you know, facilitated this project had let was leaving. They were cutting the funding to the project, and I could see the kind of slope of this is not going anywhere, uh, or sorry, the horizon of this is not going anywhere, uh, creeping ever forward very, very quickly. Um, and I thought, I've, I've got a, I've got a jump at this point. I need to leave, but what do I want to be doing? And I remember, I remember, I went to a meetup, and I gave a talk about what I was doing at this company. And there was a guy in the background that just kept staring at me, like far in the distance, like in the back. And I, I was just like, it kind of put me off a little bit. Um, and I was thinking, what, what are you, why are you staring at me? Like, and he was smiling and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, you're gonna come, like, come up to me after, the, after this talk and kind of talk to me about what I'm doing and find it really interesting. Well, lo and behold, he's left. So I've, I've finished my talk in about maybe 10, 15 minutes from the end, he's, he's no longer around. Um, and I get this random email in my inbox and it says, um, hi, Steve, we're a Kubernetes consultancy company fascinated by your story. Um, we've got a couple of, um, projects that we think that would, you'd be really, really good on. Um, nowhere in my, nowhere in my talk have I told anybody that I'm leaving. I told them it was, it was incredible. I was really enjoying it. Um, and I remember saying, okay, what have I got to lose? Let's just have a conversation. And he's based in the US. This company's all US based. There's a very small European office based out in Rotterdam. And I, um, I'm on this conference call when they're talking and they're like, yeah, we, uh, we, we're building a, a piece of Kubernetes tooling that allows it, allows, uh, or makes it easier, sorry, to bootstrap Kubernetes clusters. And I'm thinking, God damn, I could have dealt with, I could have, you know, could have had this like four or five months ago, you would have seen a heck of a lot of pain. <laughs> so I'm thinking this is a no brainer, right? I know all the problems because I've just dealt with them. You're working on something that could solve the solution. So there's like this perfect synergy um, and you'll be out on client site. So they don't have an office because there's no one in Europe. There's no one in London. I'm the only person in the UK. So I'm thinking, oh, this is fantastic, right? I get to work from home. So I don't need to commute to the office. My commute costs go down. I'm saving more money. Everything's looking great. Getting to do Kubernetes, which I found fascinating at the time, getting to go on client site. Yeah, I remember the first, like, second week that I was there, got my laptop, and then I'm, I'm off. I'm, I'm in New York City, like, in their office, talking to them about all the pains that I'd had with installing Kubernetes on Amazon and trying to, um, trying to learn Ansible at the time, because I didn't know what Ansible was. I'd come from Chef. That was what I was using in the Windows world. I hadn't, I hadn't used Ansible before. So we are, we're talking about, talking about this, and then it kind of really, the, the company kind of really took off. So there's loads that we've got, you know, tens of, custom, tens of customers. Uh, the only bad thing what's the now, What's the name of the company? What's, this co what, what's so the, the name of this company? Was, the company was called Apprenda. It's now, uh, doesn't exist anymore. I'm, I'm now a principal Kubernetes consultant going on site with customers like I've been doing this stuff for years. So I'm like kind of flying by the seat of my pants. But you already had the experience of walking in. Yeah, so I've got, I've looking, got, yeah, yeah. I've got, the, I've got the battle wounds and I've got the scars. Um, so I, can, I, know, I know some of the pains that they're going through because I've been through them before. So yeah, and at that point I'm, I'm flying around the world 
helping other helping random companies um, with their with their Kubernetes journeys from from a, a CTO saying Kubernetes is the next best thing. Can you help me move everything to Kubernetes? To you know large well known um, source control companies based out of San Francisco and dealing with huge scale. And my network just exploded because I've got loads of people from loads of different companies. Um, I'm I'm going I'm doing everything with Kubernetes. Like I've, I'm living and breathing this stuff. Um, and I, I reached burnout because I was traveling so much. Um, and I actually chose to leave because of that. Then I, I moved to, uh, to metal metals, a, a digital only bank. And, uh, they have no, they have no bricks and mortar stores. Everything's online on the handset. Um, and I was leading the platform team. So at this point they had nothing. Uh, well they had, um, I had the bare bones of the Kubernetes cluster. So I kind of come in, came in there and got to do everything I didn't get to do in the previous company, which is see something to completion from zero to a hundred. I was always coming in somewhere in that spectrum and never really got to a hundred. I would, I was always rolled out to the next client. Um, so we're, I'm using all the tools that I wanted to use, um, in the, in the CNCF landscape, all the Prometheus and Grafana and, and Helm, and we've got Flux in there for, for GitOps and we're using customize etc cetera, etc cetera. um and i yeah we took the platform from having tens of customers to fifty thousand, running all in on kubernetes and i i did that uh i jumped around a little bit and did kind of similar things um to that in a couple of roles i was kind of senior platform engineer um and then now i've landed up um as one of the the founding engineers of of ksoc because security is the last thing again that any developer wants to be doing and to your point get it out of my way please um but make sure that i don't leave a gaping hole um so that the company can get sued for millions of dollars or millions of pounds and being at the bank security must have been constantly that word was probably used a hundred times a day yeah it was um and we were building complex tooling to be able to facilitate and you know we were getting audited we had to you know i didn't want to have to take someone through a, a you know a, a thousand line spreadsheet i wanted to luckily we could use git commits because we were using GitOps. so we built a tool that made it nice and you had an export to to csv if you wanted that so we were building a lot of tooling um but one of the things that i spent most of my time doing was helping developers fix the problems and now KSOC's trying to move into auto remediation, which makes that loop even faster. So I've, I've been working on the problems that they're trying to solve. Um, and now I'm, I'm in this, I'm, I'm helping them to solve those problems. So I feel like I've, I've again kind of come full circle and now I'm sitting on the other side of the fence. How old is this company that you, that you founded here? How, uh, how long so have you it's, been? It's been going eight months. Eight months. And you have product already that people can start to to work with or play with or you yeah, have a release so we coming? Are, yeah, we have, we have a sandbox that we're, we're, um, we're allowing customers to leverage. We're, we're actually at the moment looking for design partners. Um, we've got a couple at the moment. We want some early kind of adopters to uh, essentially find the warts of the product, make sure that we're going down the right path um, and, and help us kind of uh, build a feature set that is useful for the, the customers that want to leverage it. Right. I've, there's a, there's a there's a core group of us um, that are that are there that would would want to leverage this product when we're in other companies, um, but different companies use the tool in use uh, Kubernetes in different ways. To, to your point, the QLang, the customize, the, there's so many different ways of doing the same thing. Um, are we are we going down the right path? Um, I'm, I'm What's your stack? That people... What, what so are you our building this stuff in? in? So um, it's a Go backend and a, uh, a Rails front end that is going to actually be moved to React. So it's gonna be React front end, uh, Go back end. That's really wild. The, the, it's really nice when you're able to kind of pick a technology really early on that ends up kind of winning out, right? Because you were right there in the beginning, you've seen all the changes you've seen. Did, did Heptio ever pop into your radar screen as a, potential kind of say employer because i think you would have been great for them yeah i had the chance to join i had the chance to join core os um but it was the tra it was the travel i didn't want to be traveling so much it, it put burdens on relationships that i didn't want to have burdens on um and i wanted to be at home or, or, or travel a lot less um and they couldn't give me the the commitment to the 
the travel schedule and to me it was kind of a no at that at this now looking back i probably should have done it uh for the exit <laughs> that, that they had. uh but but alas um that wasn't that wasn't the case this is your exit you just give yourself about three years <laughs> you get your exit i re i never really made it in that in that regards like uh in my in my soccer career like i never really saw um saw it to completion and i think that the career that i'm kind of meandering around now i'm, I'm getting towards seeing something to completion and that that is really exciting to me um that's kind of all i want to do i want to i want to do have the have the career that i wanted to have in football but have it in technology um that's that's kind of my my ambition brilliant all right we are we are out of time uh, this this was a great story. I, I really appreciate you, you coming on and sharing it. And I hope only the, the best for the product you're building. I, 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 I mean, I teach Kubernetes to just developers. I focus on a local environment. Um, but this type of, I can already see the type of tooling that you're trying to build is um, really, especially for developers like me who don't want to sit and read about security, just tell me how to make it secure. I'm one of the, I'm an average developer. Just tell me what I'm supposed to do and I'll do it. Like, that's, that's kind of where, yeah. Or, or we'll do it for you and you never need to know. Right, you know, when it comes to security, <laughs> that's my best, right? Because I can just push it on. Now, I, I guess at some level, you're going to need some forms of certification somehow. So I can turn around and say, well, their, their platform, is, that's certified. So you know, I'm not responsible anymore. Like, that's what I love about security. I don't want to be responsible for it. <laughs> Slopey shoulders. <laughs> yes. But you'll need some form of certifications from some, I guess, security Definitely. organizations, right? Yeah. Definitely, yeah. We're going to need to be security. We're going to need to be audited for probably the majority of the standards. We are, we're trying to take as little of the data from your, from your, uh, from your Kubernetes clusters or your platforms as possible. Um, and only taking the bare minimum and doing a lot of the a lot of the rules execution and pro kind of heavy processing on our side, um, but providing it back to you visually or via a pull request, which kind of means that we're not really keeping a lot of the data around for very long. Um, it's kind of disposable um, after we've after we've kind of consumed it, so that should hopefully make it a little bit easier. Um, but yeah, I think we're 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 going to get audited uh or we're going to audit we're going to get ourselves audited i think we are we're building features and functionality in this tool that i would have really wanted in the last kind of four to five years and knowing how i would have liked to solve it and being able to you know develop and build a product that um you know makes that possible is is an enjoyable job for me yeah i know and you have the vision because you have the experience you know what people need and I guess you get to dog food it a little bit yourself because you're going to be running your systems against this. Yeah, we're running it all the time. So all of the microservices that we deploy ourselves to run the stack are going through the stack, dog fooding every day. That's perfect. All right, Steve, if anybody wants to get in touch with you after listening to the show, what's the best? We'll put this in show notes, but just to kind of shout out, what's the best way? Sure. So email is uh, Stephen with a V at stephenwade.co.uk. Uh, Twitter handle is swade1987. So S-Wade 1987. Um, those are the best ways to reach out to me. Brilliant. All right, Steve. Thank you again for spending time and, and telling us this story. I really appreciate it. This is Bill and Steve signing off and hope to see everybody again real soon. <laughs>